the 5,000. It's the only miracle that is in all four gospel accounts, apart from the resurrection. And we, of course, expect the resurrection to be in Matthew. We expect the resurrection to be in Mark. We expect the resurrection to be in Luke. We expect the resurrection to be in John. But when it comes to what other miracles should be in all four gospel accounts, we even talked about this last week, I don't think any of us really felt that we would have chosen the feeding of the 5,000. I think when I surveyed the congregation last week, some said, well, maybe, you know, raising of Lazarus. I could picture that being in all four gospel accounts. Turning water into wine, Jesus' first miracle. I could picture that being in all four gospel accounts, right? Um, Healing of the leper, leprosy. You know, no one healed of leprosy before rabbinic eyes in the whole Old Testament, you know, except for Naaman the Syrian, right? I could see that being, right, in all four gospel accounts, leprosy being a type of sin, right? Um, And then Jesus healing a leper and saying, go show yourself to the priests, right? I could see that being in all four gospel accounts. But the feeding of the 5,000, that is the only miracle that's in all four gospel accounts. And the Lord is making a very loud proclamation with that. His heart for meeting practical needs. So many of us can so hyper-spiritualize everything that we could walk by the practical needs of humanity and it's just about, hey, I have something to tell you. And even James says, if you tell somebody, be warm and filled, but do not give them the coat to actually warm them, you know, is that love, right? James gets into that. James is a book of practical instruction. That's why the book of James is called the Proverbs of the New Testament. How many of you knew that? Because if you read it, it reads very much like Proverbs. It's just telling you how to live your life, right? So in the feeding of the 5,000 and the fact that it's in all four gospel accounts, we see the Lord's heart for meeting practical needs. The Lord's making a loud proclamation of his heart for the poor. A proclamation of just for feeling compassion for multitudes who don't know the Lord and that being the impetus for meeting their practical needs. It says when he saw the thousands, it said he had compassion on them, right? Matthew tells us the Greek word is his insides twisted. We talk about wanting to be like Jesus. Do your insides twist when you see multitudes, Or do you just get so focused on, you know, making sure that you're prayed up and is your attitude right? And all of a sudden it turns into being all about you when it's really about them. Matter of fact, we read in John's gospel and in Matthew that Jesus actually was only in the wilderness. He didn't go to the wilderness to feed the 5,000. He went to the wilderness because he just found out that his cousin John the Baptist just had his head cut off. He went there to relax and to mourn and to have alone time. He's feeding the 5,000. He puts the brakes on his alone time. He doesn't even look at himself. All he sees is the multitude. What do we see? We talk about, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Some people want to be like Mike. I want to be like Jesus. We, we know all the right things to say, but if we want to be like Jesus, what do we really see when we see multitudes before us? Is it just like, well, that's not my spiritual gift. I don't know if I have the gift of helps. Again, it turns all into us. I don't, what do I do? What do I do? Jesus just goes right into action. And what does he do? He takes five loaves and two fishes. Actually, he takes five biscuits and two salted sardines. That's really what he took. But even if he took five foot long hoagie breads and fed 5,000, it's still just as much a miracle. It's just that in the Greek, it's actually five biscuits, five muffins, if you will, and two fish, two salted sardines, which were common from the Sea of Galilee. And he multiplies, showing that he is the Elohim. He is breaking, handing out, and he is recreating as he's breaking. More so, do you know it also is a declaration of him being the resurrection? Because, right, you can take any of the seeds from our community garden out there, and you can take those seeds and you can multiply. Take six months, right, the plant and first the blade, then the fruit or whatever, but seeds do multiply, right? You could take the seeds of a grain, right, and you can multiply with it, right? All you have to do is plant what? The seed in the grain, right? So you can grow more bread. You could grow more grain by planting grain, can you not? That's multiplication, right? But can you raise up grain by planting flour? Just take some flour, you know, from the grocery store and just go out and throw it in the dirt and you're going to get grain? No, it's already been crushed, ground, it's dead. 
So even him multiplying bread, which is just flour, and he's actually showing that he's the resurrection because he's taking dead grain and multiplying it. So he's not just multiplying grain from which we get bread, he's multiplying dead grain because it's bread. So even that miracle showing that he is the resurrection, giving life where there is death. I mean, we really are beginning to see more and more why the Lord would have this in all four gospel accounts. And my prayer is that this kind of shifts from, oh, I know that story, to, wow, Lord, would you help me know this story? Do we know it as well? Maybe last week's message helped you realize, do I know my Lord's heart as well as I say? And do I know this miracle as much as I say? Or do I look at it with disdain, kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, can we move on to something more meaty? No, this is plenty of meat. Well, let's read John 6. After he feeds them, it says in verse 11, Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to them that were set down. Remember, they had the 5,000 sit down in categories or in groups so that they could efficiently distribute everything. I imagine it was sitting them down with kind of like aisles, just like we have in the church, so that the disciples could work all around and distribute, right? Right? So Jesus takes the bread, the five biscuits and the two salted sardines, gives thanks, breaks it, gives it to the disciples, and the disciples give it to them that were set down. And we look at how the Lord is doing the same thing today. Because look, the Lord could have had every person's pocket suddenly just get this big, where he multiplied it in their pockets. Could he have not? Could he have not taken the five loaves and the two fishes, break it, and every time he broke it, you know, this whole section, all their pockets, woo, right? And over here, everyone's like messenger back, whoa, right? And you literally knew where it was popping, like this whole crowd, woo, blah, 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 over here, whoa, <laughs> he could have done that, right? But he chooses to break it and give it to the disciples, the pastors, and then the pastors are taking it and giving it to the crowd. He's teaching us his economy of how he works and operates. Do you guys still, are you better than that economy? Do you think there was some sitting there like, oh, really, I got I to gotta receive it from one of the 12? It can't happen in my messenger bag? In my house? <laughs> home? <laughs> no, I'm home with my messenger bag. I need it in my messenger bag. Thank you for the, your flow chart, but I need a different flow chart. Do we still understand? Again, this miracle has a lot of meat in it, does it not? He gives it to his disciples. He gives it to the 12 pastors, if you will, and then they give it to those sitting down. In verse 12, well, really the end of verse 11, would you underline this? He gave them as much as they wanted. Underline that. It says at the end of verse 11, he gave them as much as they would. What it means is he gave them as much as they wanted. Look at that. Wow. How much do you want? Would you write Psalms 81 verse 10? I am the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. How much do you want? Because here they could have as much as they wanted. Some were asking for thirds and fourths, that means. And again, in this ancient culture, in Galilee, in the poor country, to eat like this was a rarity. He is not down in Judea uh, where the priests were and all of, you know, the the rich uh, uh, aristocracy was. Thank you for that word, right? He was not there. He's up in the north where it's poor, where it's slim pickings, where, you know what I mean? If a a raccoon came through and went through your crops, uh, that was like having your refrigerator and your pantry robbed, right? And he's giving them as much as they want. How much do we really want? No doubt, some were asking for more, some were just sitting back like, you know, had their mind on other things. When we come to the house of the Lord, how much do we really want? How much do we really want? Because here, he gave them as much as they would. Verse 12, and they were filled. They were filled, in the Greek word is they were glutted. He stuffed them, again, which was a rarity in the northern ancient farming culture up in Galilee. They were filled, and he said to his disciples, now gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. So what did they do? They gathered everything together, and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained 
over and above them that had eaten. And look at this, the Lord will always make sure that those who are in ministry are taken care of because it's 12 disciples distributing the bread and that is a lot of work. Working for the Lord is a lot of work, but when they're done, he has them collect the remains and here's another miracle. It's 12 baskets, not 10, not 32 baskets. It's 12 disciples doing the work. He has it so Governing and being sovereign over everything, there's exactly 12 baskets. Each of them get a basket. And what's not even here is what I imagine when the Lord just said to them, now you sit down and eat, and you have as much as you want. The Lord will always take care of you when you serve him. Only the devil will try to lie to you and try to, uh, they talk about profit and loss. Only the devil will come in. If you even hear anything coming close to making you imagine that the, that the losses exceed the profits, you better rebuke the devil back to the pit of hell. Only the devil would tell you that in your head. Let's do a profit loss report on this endeavor, this ministry, you know, for the Lord. Mm, losses seem high. Profits don't really know. You know what I mean? How do I get No, no, only the devil would do that. It's always profitable. He will always give you exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. We're here to walk with him. We're here to do what the first Adam didn't do. The first Adam wanted his own way, on his own timing, his own will done his way. Christ comes to walk with the Father, and it's all about his will, his timing, his way. So they gathered everything together. Verse 14, then those men... When they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, this is what they said. Now, picture this now. Are y'all with me? The miracle just went down. Everyone is stuffed. But here's the idea. It's not stuffed to where they're all sleeping. It's stuffed to where they're stuffed and they're thinking. You get it? It's not a stuffed of, and everybody knocked out in a food coma. They're stuffed, but they're stuffed and they're thinking. And here's what they start thinking. Wait a second. Moses gave manna in the wilderness. We're in a wilderness. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18.15 that a prophet, a greater prophet was coming. He just gave us bread. Yo, he is that prophet. Look at this. It says, verse 14, then those men, when they saw the miracle that Jesus did, giving modern day manna, right? They said, this is of a truth, that prophet. This is what Moses referred to in Deuteronomy 18.15 when he allowed manna to come and then said that a greater prophet would be coming. So they're right here, but they're going to be wrong right after that. You can be right and yet so wrong. They're right, but watch, everything after this is so wrong. Watch this. Verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they were going to come take him by force and make him a king, he departed into a mountain himself alone. What did they start to do? They were starting to grab him and make him king on the spot by force. And he sees what's happening. So picture this. Here are thousands of men. And now picture Lincoln Financial Field and how rowdy Eagles fans can get. They just got fed. He just took five loaves and two fishes, multiplied it, fed all of them. And they're like, yo, you thinking what I'm thinking? Yo, Deuteronomy 18.15. Yo, exactly. Deuteronomy 18.15. Moses said that one would come and do this. It's him. So... They're right. He is the one. But now everything about it is off and wrong. The mind was right. The heart was wrong. Watch what they're going to do. They start grabbing him. And you're like, come on, man. You're going to grab. Now, this shows us the humanity of Jesus. Jesus, 100% God, right? But also 100% man. He could be grabbed, <laughs> right? He could be weary from a long hike, right? He could fall asleep on a boat after a long day of ministry and sleep on the boat as it goes through a storm. That's called being really tired from ministry. He's also fully man. They start grabbing him, and it's similar to this. Have you ever seen a sporting event where the coach clearly does not want to be grabbed and thrown up on shoulders, 
right? Dunked with Gatorade. And what happens? He has to give into it. Why? Because the whole team is just strong arming him into the moment. You've never seen where the person doesn't want to go up. No, 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 no. And the crowd, ah, you know, you're going up. Woo, up in the air, catch you again. And the coach is fighting, the player doesn't want it. You've seen that happen. That's what they're about to do with Jesus. They're going to make him king right on the spot because it's like, wait a minute. He is the prophet Moses spoke about. That would make him king of kings, lord of lords. We're, gonna, we're making him king on the spot. That's raps. That's what it's happening here. We're here. We're hype. He's the one. Again, we're doing this our way. They're, he's about to grab, they're about to grab him up and make him king on the spot. What does he do when he sees this happening? Verse 15, he departs into a mountain alone. But more happens than that. Remember, this is written in four different gospel accounts. If you write down Mark chapter 6, verses 45 and 46, that's Mark's version of what happens, right? Mark says that when Jesus saw that his disciples were getting caught up in it, he forced them and commanded them to get on the boat and push the boat off. Then he himself went up into a mountain alone. That's deep. What it means is this, and this is where it shows herd mentality, right? All of us are corporate. We're a community. We're one body. But we have to make sure that we're all following the Holy Spirit, right? And not following just the, the, the energy and what is going on, right? We're supposed to be thermostats, not thermometers, right? Thermostats, by the scripture and by God's spirit, we're set. Thermometers just reflect whatever the temperature is going on, Right? So what happens is they're like, he's, he's the prophet. He's the prophet. He's Moses. Moses spoke of him. Let's grab him now, hurl him up, make him king. And then what do you, the idea is that the disciples are like, true that, true that. Yo, yes, yes, let's do it. Jesus is literally commanding them. Now picture this now. Like, let me just help you understand. Have you ever seen me try to have a meeting after service, like a meeting with those who serve here? It's work just to get everyone in this room sometimes. And, and no one's being mean or not. And everyone's just, this person's warming up some soup. This person's over there. You know, this person's just MIA. But it's like, oh, come on in, you guys. Let's, come, yeah. Hey, hey, come on in. Yo, meeting time. I make little fun songs. Come on. And then once everyone's in this room, hey, I don't have the mic. Everyone's sitting in the first three rows. I've only been saying the same thing for like, we've only been having meetings for, you know, how 20 years. You know, hey, sit up in the front. My point is I'm not complaining. That takes a level of work. I'm only sharing this story like that because I love it. I love any opportunity I get to find anybody. I'll even ask you what you're putting in your soup. But then I'll say, hey, come on in the meeting, right? I'm only sharing that because we tend to make these stories like little kid stories. So when it says that Jesus is compelling his disciples to get in the boat, we kind of picture them saying, hey, um, we're going to make you king by force. Our hands are on you. Um, and then the other disciples are like, we kind of think that's a good idea. And Jesus is saying, well, I kind of want you in the boat. That's not what's happening here. They're, this crowd is energized. They're hyped. They're trying to make him king and hoist him up on the spot. The disciples who he's been teaching them to follow him, to seek his heart, to seek his face, they're deciding to take a no-brainer moment. They're just riding the wave now. And Jesus is literally yelling at them, no, you, Get on the boat. A picture, he has to yell over the crowd, man, just turn the mark. That way you realize this is no eisegesis here. This is all exegesis. Exegesis is when I read the Bible and let it talk for itself. Eisegesis is when I put in there what I want to put in there. We don't do that here, okay? Please go to Mark chapter 6, verses 44 through 46, and I'm going to read. And they did eat of the loaves, and they were about 5,000 men. And verse 45, immediately, meaning straightway, he constrained. It means he is forcing the disciples get into the ship and get to the other side before to Bethsaida while he sent away the people. He is yelling for them to get in the boat. What he is doing is he's protecting them from the emotionalism of the moment. He is teaching them how to not only know the word, but how to have not just mind, but mind and emotion in line with the word. Because even the disciples are like, well, yeah, we know the word. Moses, he's the new Moses. They're going to make him king. They're getting caught up. 
Look at the, like the heart of Jesus. Do you see the heart of it? He is constraining them to get on. I mean, can you just picture what that's like? Getting 12, 12 men on a boat, right? 12 men yelling for all of them, get on the boat to get them away from this moment of hype. Look, the Lord wants us to be hype. You know, as a pastor, you've seen me get hype. We should be a people that get charged and get zealous for the things of the Lord. Titus teaches we should be a people characterized by zeal, but it's got to be a hype that is in line with the Holy Spirit, not a hype that's just human hype. They have every cause to be happy because of the miracle of the bread, but now it's human hype. But it gets even a little bit deeper than that. Let's go back to John chapter 6. Why does he not allow them to make him king on the spot? Right? Because that's a great question. If he truly is the fulfillment of Moses, yes? If he did that miracle to show that he is bringing the new manna, yes? If they are supposed to connect the dots and realize that he is the prophet Moses spoke about, yes? All of that was supposed to happen. Why doesn't he allow them to make him king on the spot? Isn't that a great question? Why refuse that? Well, some might say, well, he had to go to the cross first right? He had to go wear a crown of thorns before wearing a crown of glory. Yes, that would be a right answer. Why else? Because he sees their hearts, and you're going to see their hearts at the end of this chapter. They don't want Jesus for who he is. They want a bread king. They want a Jesus who gives them what they want. They want a Jesus who fills their belly, allows them to have a good burp. They don't want to follow Jesus. They just want what Jesus can give them. He doesn't want to be anybody's bread king. He will not be your bread king. He won't be your grilled cheese sandwich king. He won't be your Sunday at your favorite diner in your favorite seat with your favorite waiter who brings you your favorite coffee that's at your favorite temperature during your favorite time of the year. King. He's got to be the king of kings, the Lord of your heart, who you will follow wherever he calls you to follow, no matter what, no matter what comfort zones get ripped apart, no matter how scared you might even be at times, or even wondering, Lord, are you even with me? This is too big for me. Lord, you're my king. And that's where we show our devotion. He wants us devoted to his heart, not devoted to the things that he gives because he's good. Are you devoted to the heart of Jesus? Or are you only devoted to, he's so good. I mean, the Bible says his paths drop fatness. It means the idea is that, you know, in gardening, you create paths. The paths are for the, the person, you know, reaping the harvest just to gather. It's saying he's so good. And his crops is such an abundance that just to walk behind him on his paths, just to follow him at a distance, you're still going to be picking up stuff because all of his baskets are always overflowing. So you can follow Jesus at a distance and still get rocked. You can follow Jesus at a distance and still get stuffed and full. You can follow Jesus at a distance and still get blessings on the job. He's just that good, eternally good. Amen? But if we don't keep it straight, we will get it twisted. And you may find yourself in a place where you don't love the heart of Jesus anymore. Push comes to shove. All of a sudden, what you want and what he might have for you has a head-on collision, and you don't like that. And then all of a sudden it reveals that the heart of Jesus is not really what you're after. You just want a bread king. And we all need to watch our hearts. We need to examine our hearts because he's good. I mean, how many of y'all could stand and say that you have blessings and are at a place in your life that you never imagined when you were a kid? I know I can. Two cars. I still walk outside. My kids will tell you, what are you doing? I'm just looking at two cars they know the story. Growing up, I didn't have a car. We walked. And I'm talking like, you know when you're walking and you're carrying stuff so hard as a little kid, you learn to carry stuff on your head? Yeah? You ever come home from the grocery store carrying so much stuff when you walk, your fingers are locked like this for five minutes? That? I'm, you're, you're, yum. And when it snows, you got to put Vaseline on your face? War. Going to the store is war. You get frostbite. Oh, real stuff. Then you walk with Jesus. You got a car. <laughs> you got the heat on. You open the refrigerator, you can't see the back wall. What? Options. I don't want leftovers. <laughs> Look, he's good. And then what he does for us psychologically, how many of you were in a place of peace that as a kid you never thought, you wondered if you would even be sane when you were an adult? And now you're not only sane, 
but you got same kids. <laughs> wow, he, he, he blew you away. He kept you sane and now got babies that came from your crazy self and they're sane. But we need to be careful because he's so good to us. We got to make sure the blessings are designed to drive us to the cross, to drive us to the heart that is the source of these blessings. But if we're not careful, you will end up just wanting a bread king. How do I know if all I want is a bread king? A good indication is all of a sudden you only know the Bible verses that talks about what he'll do for you. You no longer know all the Bible verses about what you could do for him. That's a great litmus test. Bible verses. What are the verses you know? Oh, well, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he'll raise up a standard against me. Ooh. He protects me from Pennywise and Jason and Michael Myers, right? Oh, yeah, and he does. What's another one? Um, Oh, yeah, you know, uh, I'm more than a conqueror through him that loves us. By my God, I run through a troop. I leap over a wall. Psalm 18. Yeah, exactly. All right, now what about the verses of what you could do for him? It says in the book of Acts, these were those who hazarded their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says in Revelation of the 144,000, these are those who followed the Lamb wherever he went, even if it's the valley of the shadow of death. We got to make sure that we just don't know the verses of all of what he does for us, the bread, the bread of protection, the bread of a good night's sleep, the bread of peace with your enemies, the bread of, oh, oh, yeah, Lord, the Bible says that, you know, all the hearts of men are in your hands and you could change the hearts of rulers. Change my boss. And then you go into work and your boss is standing there. Coffee? Promotion? I'm sorry for anything I've ever done. And again, he's that kind of good, but do you only know the verses of what he'll do for you And don't also know just as many verses, because the Bible has both. And the Bible even teaches, in light of his mercy, Romans 12, 1, in light of his goodness, in light of the aforementioned mercies, present your body now as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. You throw yourself on the altar, meaning do whatever you want with me, but you're alive and well. You're more alive than you've ever been, and you're alive for him, wherever he'll send you, whatever he'll tell you to do. Let's make sure that we know the verses of what we'll do for him and not just the verses of what he'll do for us. And that's how you protect your heart from wanting just a bread king instead of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I tell you what, I think the Lord just spoke to us so hard. I'm going to end right there and we're going to have communion. I literally feel that the Lord has just said to me, I'll get into some other topics. I'll crack a joke or two. We might forget this moment. Let's make sure that while we look at them and how they could be so fickle and so quick and to to just want them, all they want is a bread king. Jesus withdraws. Not because it's not not true. It's, It's as true as ever. He is the one that Moses was speaking of. But he won't just be the bread king. He will be Lord of all or he won't be Lord at all. He's not, he didn't come down just to be the bread king. He came to be the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Pick up your cross daily. The cross is an instrument of death. He that loves his life will lose it. He that loses his life for my sake will find it. He said, there is no one who has forsaken family, who has forsaken career, who has forsaken comfort, who will not be rewarded of me a hundredfold when I return. But if we don't believe that, then we're going to say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I don't know if I believe this. Give me my bread because I don't know about what's to come. And again, it always comes down eventually to revealing if we're worshiping Jesus as just the bread king or the king of kings, Because when life challenges come, and they will come, when life's challenges come, all of a sudden you fall away and do what you want to do. That is a great indicator. Because now do you see why, y'all? Now do you see why Jesus is going to say to them, he separates the wheat from the chaff, right? And I want to make sure my people giving out communion hear this. Now do you see why he says to them one of the most radical things that he could have said? 
because he wants to separate. The Lord loves us. He loves the disciples too much to let them get caught up and just thinking that he's a bread king all of a sudden. And he loves them so much that he's going to bring a hard truth that's going to get their mind right. It's like smelling salts. This is when, and we'll see it next week, this is when Jesus steps in front of them and says this, right? The next day, he says this to them. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And what does it say in John chapter 6, verse 66? Many said, this is a hard saying, and many walked away. You see, he will not be just your bread king, nor will he allow you to continue to exist thinking that uh, having him as a bread king is a sound systematic theology. He said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many walked away. What he's saying is, you don't just eat the blessings I give. Yes, when you eat bread, what happens? You eat it. It goes into your stomach through mechanical and, you know, chemical reactions. The body is broken down to a liquid. It goes into your small intestine. It, the nutrients are then absorbed and enzymes are breaking it down. You assimilate it to all of the, the millions and billions of cells throughout your body. You assimilate it. He's saying, hey, you're into taking in all of my blessings, but I want to tell you something. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have to eat and assimilate me all throughout your body. Not just truths about me to have in your head and say, oh yeah, he is the fulfillment of Moses. You've got to have me running all through your body or you don't have eternal life. I've got to be running through your mind. I've got to be running through your heart. I've got to be running through your will. And oh yeah, we fall short and make big dumb mistakes. But that's where we come back to the gospel. That's where we get up, brush ourselves off with the blood of Jesus and start anew, Yes right? We'll fail him a million times. He'll never fail us once, but we still fight to do it. But now do you get why Jesus says one of the most hard statements he ever says? It's to this crowd the next day. He loves us too much to leave us in a state of just wanting a bread king. And I will tell you, we live in a day. We live in a day. It's a scary day. We live in a day where you can want Jesus as just your bread king and you could still be called an on-fire Christian in today's church. That's bad. In the book of Acts, life separated the wheat from the chaff every day. Now do you see sometimes why Christians in other countries pray that persecution will come to America? Not because they're hating on us. Oh, haters, mind your business. No, they realize that the easy life here is producing soft Christians that are having a warped view of Jesus. And what hardship does is it forces you to have to be real. Is this thing real or not? Is the peace I have real or not? Am I in line with his will or not? Am I seeking his word or not? Do I really have faith or not? Yes? So what do we do with a message like this? We've got to really stop and say the honest truth. Maybe the reason why I have no peace, no joy, is because I'm just wanting Jesus as just a bread king. And then what starts to happen is then you even become critical of the bread. Because you see, you know, the blessings, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're temporal. The blesser is eternal. So now because you're living off a diet of the temporal, now all of a sudden even, even that's not, not even floating your boat anymore. But the Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You never get bored being close to Jesus. But it can't be Jesus the bread king. It's got to be Jesus the king of kings. Amen. Let's have the worship team come up and let's have the elements distributed. John is indeed the gospel. John is indeed the book of the Bible that is designed to rock us and to rock us into that place where we just get so close to Jesus that we're back to rocking in his arms again. If there's anyone here and you just miss being close to Jesus, you miss being, feeling close to Jesus, then perhaps this is the message today that's here to set things straight. You've been looking at the wrong Jesus. You've been looking at a, a lowest common denominator Jesus, a Jesus who's not even the Jesus of the Bible anymore. You've just been looking at the blessings. You've just been following him for the bread as opposed to looking at the bread to realize that his heart is the heart that is all for you. Again, 
Here is the litmus test. If you know more verses of the Bible talking about all of what he gives you, all of the bread, then you know all of the verses that says that you should now be bread that he can break and distribute. Yes? I'll say it one more again. If you know more verses in the Bible about the bread he gives you, as opposed to the verses in the Bible where it's just as many saying now your life is to be bread that he can break and send out into the world to send wherever he will, then it's a chance that you have been looking at Jesus just as the bread king. Is this convicting, y'all? It is convicting, is it not? But isn't it necessary? Don't you realize that without rhema word teaching of the Bible, we can actually come to church every Sunday and be getting all the theological nuggets and still be off and don't know where to put our finger on it. That's why rhema word teaching is important. What does rhema mean? Rhema means it is a Holy Spirit activated pinpointed word straight from heaven, straight from the, for the moment we're in. And you know your moment has just got rearranged and adjusted by the Holy Spirit. It's God's ultimate act of love. It's the ultimate act of love. When you sit down and you have talks with your, with your kids, you know, and, and it's, well, I don't want to talk about this. No one's going to steal me. No one's going to abduct me. You're like, you, you don't understand. It's, this is the ultimate act of love to talk about these things, right? This is, you should right now feel loved. He's not the police officer who just kicked the door of your heart in and has got the, the flashlights all on you and you're blinded by the light. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the great physician who's come into the examination room that you're in and with gentleness, he just accurately just put his finger on something that he doesn't want to metastasize throughout your body anymore. He wants you to let him spread through your body. But it's got to be him according to what the Bible says, not the bread king. So here's some questions. Your home, bread, is your home open for anybody? Or is it anything but my home? Your car, bread, is it available for anyone? Can the keys, anyone? Your clothes, bread, we take them off your back, give them to anyone, moment's notice, never mind if it's your favorite, whatever. Comfort zones. What about places you want to be and, and you don't want to be? What about seasons where you're somewhere? Seasons at the job. Yeah. You're getting calls for other jobs. It's like, no, the Lord has me right here. Right? What about seasons of ministry? Seasons of ministry in church. It's not the ministry you would have picked. It's not the ministry you would have picked in a hundred lifetimes. But isn't that why you came to Jesus? Because not only are you a sinner, but you don't know how to pick anything right for yourself either. Remember you first came to Jesus, you didn't even have faith in your ability to order lunch right? <laughs> Lord, help me order lunch today. Um, <laughs> I'm so tired of my own decisions. And then what happens? All of a sudden, we grow a little bit in the Lord, and we think that all of a sudden, the same way in the beginning, we prayed about everything. Now, all of a sudden, we don't even need to seek the Word or seek His heart or anything. Now, now we're into making all these decisions. Bread. We're now to be the bread that He can break. And our only question for Him is, Lord, Am I being, am I breakable enough for you to use? That's the only question. Not whether I like it or not. Not whether it's what I would have chosen or not. But I tell you this, you will always, always, always find his presence. No matter what. And his presence is everything. I remember being in Puerto Rico right after Hurricane Maria. And we flew in there. And remember, that was even when our current president was talking about completely shutting Puerto Rico down. And what did I decide to do? Because the Lord put on my heart. The Lord put on my heart. The leaders of the church felt it was all from the Lord too. He put on my heart. To, me and some members of Antioch flew into Puerto Rico. And we were going to actually look for even some of their family members that were MIA. Remember, it was pitch black there. Anarchy, right? The bread king, the, the part of me that wants to look at a bread king, I, I, Jesus the bread king, I would not, Aaron worshiping Jesus the bread king, I would have never gone. But Aaron following the king of kings, I would go. I remember we landed there, and as soon as we landed, the airport blacked out. It was literally like walking into something unspeakable and the door just slamming. And, and like in the movie when they walk in in Lord of the Rings, and the way you walk in, the cave falls and the rocks. Now it's like literally an avalanche. You're not getting out. It's like, I'm not going home. 
But what I do? Go, just turn around. No, no, no. I'm following not the bread king. Because there's no bread right now, okay? But there's Jesus. There was no bread. It didn't say like, oh man, the airport went black and then a bread cart pulled up, you know, with a bed. We called, there was no hotels. We were starting to just find somewhere where the car could actually be in water that was at least this high or lower just to sleep in a car for the night in the pitch black. We actually found one room in the nick of time. Then I remember standing there and a the doctor's like, yeah, you know, rat fever's breaking out here now. I'm looking at him and I'm like, oh, wow. You know, you know, you know what my, inside my mind was, what Aaron inside of me did? <laughs> rat fever, I don't even know what rat fever is. But it doesn't sound good. It sounds like deadly, you know? But yo, it wasn't the bread king. I was okay because I was following the king of kings. Then we went up into the mountains and rocks had just come down the size of something out of a sci-fi movie and just run through houses and we're sitting there and we're playing a little dominoes. And me and one of the members of Antioch are talking and we're thinking we can have a -a tete-a-tete because everyone at the table only spoke Spanish. And then all of a sudden, we're having this little tete-a-tete, and the one dude, just shady as anything, just says like, yeah, something, 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 yeah. I'm like, oh, he heard the whole conversation. They were plotting to kidnap me. That was the plot, and they came back later looking for me. I realized at that moment, I hopped in the car, and I got out of there. They came back around with the car with the tent of windows. Later on, hey, where's the pastor who was giving out all the money? They were going to kidnap me. That's what they were doing. They were kidnapping people and killing them. Went back. My point is this, I'm the biggest sinner of all, I'm the chief of sinners, but I just want to teach that following Jesus often, just because, but there's joy there too, so I'll come back from a trip like that, and I'm like, yo, it was the Lord, and everyone's like, oh man, it must have been easy. No, 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 it was fearful, it was scary, I would have not have chosen it in a million times, rat fever, and everything else, right? Almost got kidnapped for real, but you know what? Because when you walk with Jesus, his pleasures, his heart, his presence is what makes you feel amazing. You don't, even want, you don't even need the bread anymore. So I just want to encourage each of you, let's make sure that we see Jesus correctly, and let's make sure we see ministry correctly. Because when you see Jesus correctly, you'll see ministry correctly. When you see Jesus incorrectly, you'll see ministry incorrectly. How do you view ministry? That is an indication of how you view Jesus. There's not two separate things. So, are you encouraged today? Are you encouraged to just say, Lord, thank you? Because who wants to just be worshiping bread? Thank you for directing me to your heart where all of this bread comes from. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for redirecting me back to the sweet spot. Thank you for directing me to your heart. Thank you. And now it has to be a matter of, Lord, what will you have me to do? Should be the next question. What will you have me to do? Not what do I want to do. What would you have me to do? And I promise no matter what it is, his presence, his presence. Look, Moses learned that. He's, Lord, you're giving us manna every day. You're giving us manna every day. But if your cloud does not go, we're not going. Moses learned that. He did not want a bread king. I don't need just the manna. How many of you guys? Would you have said that to the Lord? Or would you have just said, okay, oh, oh, the cloud stays? Okay, but can you please give manna every day? It gets kind of hungry down there. Oh, you'll give manna every day? Cool. How many of you would, would have said like Moses, never mind the manna. If your presence does not go with us, we are not, I don't want to move. Let's come back to loving Jesus. And look, give thanks for the blessings. But just make sure that in that, you're celebrating the heart that your Jesus has for you, and not just the bread that he's stuffing you with. So let's take a moment now. We're going to remember the cross. This is the ultimate, ultimate proclamation of the heart of God. If you want to know the heart of God, study the cross. If you, how do I, how do I get out of this rut? Okay, all I want is bread. You're right, you're right, I get it. You know, I, I'm, I thought that my hype was the hype of the Holy Ghost. I'm just getting hype off bread. How do I get back? You go back to the cross. That is where you study the cross. You study the cross. You sit and you just reread what he did on the cross, that he did it for you, that he loves you. That is where you come back to the heart of God. God so loved the world, heart, that he gave his only begotten son. So let's remember now. Let's do it now together. Isn't that beautiful? We get to break this in the molars of our teeth. And as we do that, we remember his heart.
Greater love has no man than this, than he lays down his life for his friends. Let's take the bread and remember his heart. And not only did his heart speak of his body being broken, but his body was broken so that blood, the blood that washes our sins away, even the goofy sins of loving the bread more than we love the giver of the bread. All paid for, amen? Let's remember his blood, hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for visiting us today, and we love you. We love you, and we just want to worship you now. Forgive us, Lord, for the whack worship of you as just a bread king and not the king of kings and the Lord of lords of our lives, our destinies, our day-to-day, our everything. Lord, here we are again. We make a fresh pledge of allegiance to you. And we don't just want to know the Bible verses about all of what you do for us, but Lord, in light of your goodness, ah, may we study the word to see what we should be doing for you as our reasonable service. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're also going to receive this afternoon's offering. You can give through Cash App, which is dollar sign, Antioch Philly. Give online, antiochphilly.org slash give. And let's worship the Lord now. Let's just worship him. Amen? Let's, let's worship. Thank you, Brother Josh. Mm-hmm.